Thank you for being here today. I guess we'll just start with introducing ourselves. Um, well, as we said, Matthew is our job coach. He works in both the Employment Accessibility uh, Services Program and Transitions for Youth. There's some overlap between those programs. And then I'm Nara Dillon Cheatham, uh, and I'm the coordinator of programs and services for persons with disabilities. So I work here and there a little bit with all the programs. And then we wanted to get to know you folks a little bit as well, kind of gauge what you're hoping to uh, get out of this program today. Do you want to take it away? Sure. Um, if Tell you don't me. mind putting yeah. out the. Uh... So maybe if we can go around the room and you can um, give us your names, uh, what type of work that you're looking to get into, and what do you hope to take away from today's workshop? So yeah, so once we get down um, what you're hoping to gather from our workshop today, we'll go into um, some detail about our different program and s programs and services that we offer for persons with disabilities. Um, and then we'll come back to the, uh, the questions and um, you know, uh, try and answer the best we can uh, to any questions or concerns or any information you would like to gather uh, today. Uh, disability, it is broad for, it depends on the, so there are criteria for some of the different programs that we have, but it can be fairly broad. Like we wouldn't be here if we didn't think that most likely um, you can fall with, you'll be able to access our services. Um, for some of the programs, we do have to get approval through, through government um, for access to it. For some, um, they just expect somebody self-identify as a disability as well and we can get we'll get a bit more into that uh, but i generally folks should be able to qualify for for many of these programs arthritis, arthritis is definitely considered a disability yes mm -hmm. um usually i'll see job openings for i know cnib is on a charity village if you know it i think i've seen kidney related jobs on uh, on charity village as well yeah charity village yes it's a website. It's a good database for like nonprofit jobs. Yeah, if you can't book a medical appointment outside of work hours and it's necessary for a disability related reason, your employer's got a duty to accommodate that. Yeah, no, it's um, we can like within our programs we get into like how to talk about accommodations with your employer. Yeah. That's a really important um, that's a really important aspect of it. Yeah. Um, but I say the employer's got to do the dance. They've got to hire you based on your qualifications and then we talk about accommodations and that's the point where they can determine if they should or shouldn't, if they can or cannot accommodate you. They should hire you first, then go through the, the legal dance on duty to accommodate. Yeah. And that's where they can have the conversation about whether they can or can't, but that's why you don't need to disclose up to that point. Depends on like what, like you never need to tell your employer your diagnosis. You could tell them, you know, I'm going to a medical appointment relating to disability. Um, that's what you legally need to tell them. And the employer has the right to ask for proof that you were at a medical appointment. So maybe a notice from the doctor's office or if they are sending you an email that confirms the appointment, you could show that to the employer. Uh, but they don't need to know what the diagnosis is. Um, just very general if you're asking for an accommodation in the workplace, what is the, the nature of the disability. Unless you think the disability might affect a health and safety issue in the workplace. Um, so for example, medications that make you drowsy and you're operating heavy duty machinery, you don't necessarily need to disclose uh, the diagnosis. Um, so if there's a health and safety issue, you, the obligation is on you to disclose. So if the medications make you drowsy, for example, and you're op operating machinery, and it might turn into a health and safety issue, you'd have to tell your employer in advance. In that circumstance, you do. But um, if there's no health and safety issue, you don't need to disclose your exact diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It's not needed to discuss it with the staff, yeah. It's, no, unless there's like um, anything health and safety related, there's really no reason. Um, but one kind of good rule of thumb is when you're discussing it with the manager, as a courtesy, ask that they please keep this between the two of you. <laughs> um, it generally, I mean, if, uh, if coworkers know about something, it starts the rumor mill, you probably don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Um, but coming from the legal world, I'd advise, because there's just because of the technicalities during that conversation with your manager, just ask as a courtesy that they please keep this between you. The manager might need to discuss it with the HR department, but doesn't need to be discussed with the whole office. 
So we are a nonprofit agency and we've been around since 1980. Um, we've got three locations in the Toronto area. Uh, one is at Lakeshore and Islington, uh, but most, a lot of our, some of our disability programs do run out of that area. Matthew and I work out of the King and Dufferin area though, um, and we do have an office at Chauncey and Islington, so that's closer to the subway station. Uh, we don't have too many programs operating out of that location. Um, so the disability programs are funded by a few different sources, federal, provincial, uh, United Way of Toronto uh, funds Transitions for Youth, and the Ontario Trillium Foundation. And we've been a member of the United Way since 1985. Um, and then we have programs that offers, um, we, we offer programs to job seekers uh, for many different walks of life. Uh, we of course work with adults, internationally trained professionals, newcomers to Canada, persons with disabilities, students, youth, uh, women, and seniors. Um, so today, many folks are thinking about returning to work, either returning to work after a disability leave to the same job, maybe switching fields, or maybe you've been out of the, the workplace for a while. Um, so our uh, disability <coughs> programs um, can be tailored to discuss specific me needs, such as entry to the labor market for persons with disabilities. So youth first entering the labor market, uh, for example. Um, changing jobs that best suit disability related needs. So I was hearing people talking about scheduling accommodations or um, standing versus sitting in the workplace, finding a job that meets those needs. Um, so job search skills and techniques, so the classics that we were talking about. Um, resume writing, cover letters, uh, interview skills. Um, we can focus with you on that or discussing, say, gaps in the resume that might occur for disability related reasons. Um, and then working with your employer to discuss uh, disability related needs and accommodations. A lot of people are bringing uh, that issue up. And then as well, we do do some job development. So connecting with employers that are excited and ready to work with individuals with disabilities. Um, so we have a few different programs. The one that Matthew and I both work on is the Employment Accessibility Program. So we do a lot of job coaching, job counseling on, um, on those classic uh, job search skills, resumes, uh, cover letters, and we try to develop individualized job action plans. So sometimes it's good to have um, the coach working with you to discuss where am I gonna do my applications. Having that conversation, committing you to doing it uh, can be a really great step uh, to meeting those employment goals and being motivated. Um, determining what might be a good um, a good place to work if you are able to accept and maintain competitive employment. Um, we can do mock interviews so you can see our fabulous acting skills at play. Um, guidance on your disclosure and accommodations. We also do job retention and support. So once you're in the job, if things get a little rocky around accommodations, we can uh, be there to help coach you through that. Um, and then we also have lots of connections to job postings, job fairs, networking events all across the city. Um, so as I was mentioning, after we've kind of gotten those classic uh, skills down, we can help connect you to job development. Um, so we have a job development team at JobStart, um, individuals that are focused on creating jobs for you. Um, so we'll give you, we'll help you set up that interview, help you work with an employer uh, potentially. Um, and we'll help you work on marketing your skills and abilities specific to the job. So your customer service background is great in so many different fields, for example, help you market that. Um, and we can also talk about advancement in your career because that's the great thing about working. You can always work your way up the ladder. Uh, we also have access to exceptional work-related supports. Um, so sometimes folks in the labor market require assistive devices, so maybe a screen reader or other technologies. Um, and we have some funding to help work with your employer potentially on, uh, depending on which program you're in and funding requirements and what resources the employer has to help uh, with 
getting uh, the funding for certain work-related accommodations in place if this is something that might be pertinent to you. So the Employment Accessibility Program, as we were mentioning, are different programs, have different uh, criterias. Uh, so you must be over the age of 17 um, and actively seeking employment in the greater Toronto area. Um, it says here you have to live in Ontario, but specifically Toronto for our program. If you live outside of Toronto, let us know. We can help you find uh, programs uh, for that. Um, you have to, of course, be legally allowed to work in Canada. Um, have a medically verifiable disability. So a visual, hearing, health, learning disability, mental health disability, arthritis, diabetes. Um, so one of the requirements is that you cannot be receiving Ontario Works. Um, so for this program, many individuals are currently on Ontario Disability Support Program. Um, if not though, um, we, we can still access the program. We just have to do a teeny tiny bit of extra paperwork. Okay, capability. Do you want to cover this? Yep, sure. Perfect. Um, so capability is a program that is run out of our Lakeshore location, so Islington and Lakeshore. Um, so this is a more intensive program. As you can see here, it's between uh, six and eight weeks of pre-employment training, um, which includes development workshops and activities. So uh, a number of the um, material that they cover over the six to eight weeks is career exploration, um, there's first aid training and CPR training certification that's provided at no cost to you. Mm -hmm. um, there's guest speakers, field trips as well. Um, you get access to our peer employment mentoring program, which we're going to discuss um, at the end. Um, there's workshops on accommodation and disclosure. Um, uh, we also have a, a workshop series called Personality Dimensions. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of personality dimensions training, but um, that's something that's also offered through the six to eight weeks of pre-employment training through Capability. Um, and you receive one-on-one -on -one job coaching. Uh, so the job coach for this program is uh, Irfran, and he's not here with us today, mm -hmm. uh, but he's very capable and knows the program inside and out. Mm -hmm. And um, lastly, uh, through the workshops, you'll get a good understanding of different job search strategies and interview prep uh, techniques. So basically, uh, the program kind of um, encompasses what we would do in the Employment Accessibility Program, but in a group setting. Mm -hmm. So over the six to eight weeks, um, the, it's, uh, the, the workshops run from Monday to Thursday. Uh, I believe it's 9.30 to 3.30. So you go over all of the core fundamental skills, resume writing, cover letter writing, interview skills, mm -hmm. um, uh, career exploration, which is what they start off with. We, uh, they go over everything very intensely over the six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then following the six to eight weeks of workshops, there is 12 weeks of paid work experience. Um, so some of the areas or fields that um, individuals that have gone through the capability program have ended up in have been healthcare, IT information technology, administration, customer service, so call centers, office, retail, um, as well as financial services, so banks, accounting firms, investment companies, hospitality and tourism, manufacturing, and also nonprofit and social services. So a whole wide range of um, different, different fields. So ideally, uh, it would be right away, but it might take some time it, to find that 12-week work placement. Mm -hmm. So it, it really depends. Um, a lot of it comes down to how much work you're willing to put into it. Um, we have people who, you know, they finish the program and they're able to find a placement right away. Mm -hmm. Right after the program, the next week they're starting in a job. Mm -hmm. Do you find it or do we find it? So it's uh, working together to find it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there's other individuals who, uh, you know, not necessarily put in this, the, the required efforts and it takes longer for them to find that 12 week work placement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, depending on funding, it 
um, of the organization itself, not necessarily, they might, because you're a trained employee, they might think, great, you're trained, you're ready to go, let's hire you on. Maybe it was a temp, like it depends on the role you end up in and the employer needs, but we do have many people who successfully get hired on in the new role. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also it's helpful as well as um, if you have a, a long gap in your work history, getting this 12 week work placement, which you know it's a, around three months, it helps to build up your, your uh, work experience again and helps you get your foot in the door. So you might not necessarily uh, continue working on in the, the same organization um, you were working for in the 12 weeks, but that work experience helps you get your foot in the door elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the, the very bottom here, uh, it says that you can receive job retention support via the Employment Accessibility Program, which uh, Nora was talking about, as well as the Peer Mentoring Program, which we're going to be talking about in the future. So um, you, uh, you can be a part of more than one program, but just not simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So if you were in capability but needed additional support after you finished the um, six to eight weeks of workshops plus the work placement, mm -hmm. then it, you have the option of um, get being enrolled into the Employment Accessibility Program if mm -hmm. that's what you wish to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the eligibility criteria for the capability program. Um, so you just need to self-identify as having a disability. So this is uh, one of the main differences between capability and the EAS program or Employment Accessibility Program. Um, for the Employment Accessibility Program, you have to have uh, verification of your disability in order to be enrolled. But for a capability, uh, you just need to self-identify as having a disability. Um, so you must be unemployed, legally entitled to work in Canada, and not in receipt of EI benefits within the last three years. So unfortunately, if you qualify for EI, you are not eligible for this program. But we have others. Mm -hmm. um, and it says here to be motivated to work and committed to job search. Uh, which is a given, mm -hmm. um, able to attend the six to eight weeks of pre-employment workshops and activities, and available for 12-week work placement following <coughs> the workshops. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'm going to touch on the Transitions for Youth program, which is the program that I run. Uh, so the purposes of the Transitions for Youth program is to help develop and strengthen employer-recognized and in-demand soft skills for youth with disabilities. Um, so does anyone know the difference between hard skills and soft skills? Hard skills stuff? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we were to look at accounting as an example, mm -hmm. being able to balance a ledger would be a hard skill. Soft skills, we think of them as people or interpersonal skills, so teamwork, communications, um, uh, your prof professional image, that type of thing. So why did we create a program dedicated to soft skills for the development? Um, so we did some research uh, at Jobstart, and we found that um, the employers that we were working with um, were looking for employees with well-developed soft skills. So this is, keep in mind, this is a program for youth. Um, so what we were finding was uh, that a lot of the youth that our employers were hiring didn't necessarily come with um, well-developed soft skills. So those communication skills, teamwork skills, professional image, those things kind of seem to be lacking. Mm -hmm. um, so in order to kind of fill in that gap, we created this program. Um, so like I said, according to employers, there is a lack of developed soft skills amongst hired youth. And soft skills are essential for not only impressing on the job, but more importantly, to keep a job. And um, Jobstar is not the only agency that's um, done this research. Uh, the Muskoka, Muskoka Simcoe Bo uh, <coughs> Workforce Board, I believe that they're called, they did a much larger scale research study and they found similar findings as what we did here. What is the youth now? Yeah, so it's, uh, for our purposes, it's between the ages of 16 and 29. 29? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Used to be 34. Mm -hmm. Things change. Yeah. <laughs> Give me an honorary, if you all can be. <laughs> <laughs> be. 
So um, employers are looking for leadership qualities, good communicators, good listeners, the willingness to learn new things, the ability to work well with others, and good understanding of proper workplace etiquette. Mm -hmm. So um, just to give you a snapshot of what the program looks like, so it's a series of group-based workshops that deals specifically with soft skills development. Um, it's two weeks in length, Monday to Friday, and runs from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. So it's just half days. It's not a huge time commitment. Um, and once the workshop series is complete, uh, you receive individual job coaching uh, to help enter the labor market through myself. So the types of training you can expect from the Transitions for Youth program, um, they also offer three days of personality dimensions training, as I was talking about in the, uh, capa for the capability program. Um, so communication skills workshop, health and wellness, workplace etiquette and professionalism, team building or teamwork, leadership, and also a whole day dedicated to accommodation and disclosure. So this is just a sample calendar of the Transitions for Youth program. You can see how it's uh, outlined here, Monday to Friday, 9.30 to 12.30, and every day is a different workshop um, covering soft skills development. All right, so um, through the Transitions for Youth program, we have a mentorship initiative. So as part of the Transitions for Youth program, you have the opportunity to be matched with a mentor from our pre-employment mentoring program, which we're gonna touch on next. So all mentors are working, are, they're working professionals, so your mentor will be an additional resource to help you in your job search. Mm -hmm. um, the mentorship period is usually for three months in length, mm -hmm. and meeting, meetings can take uh, many forms depending on what's agreed upon between yourself and the mentor. So it could be in-person, face-to-face, phone calls, emails, um, video chat, Skype, um, whatever you uh, deem would be the best fit. Okay, so our criteria or eligibility criteria for the Transitions for Youth program is that um, you're a youth between the ages of 16 and 29, also again legally entitled to work in Canada, um, be a person with a disability including self-disclose or self-declared, um, able to attend and participate in the two weeks of workshops and actively seeking employment in the GTA. All right. Perfect. Um, so we did mention that we have some peer employment mentoring for youth. Uh, we also have peer employment mentoring for anybody of any age. Um, this is also a really great program if you're thinking, I might want to get into the labor market you know, a few months from now, but I'm not at a you know, at this point, maybe for a health reason, I don't need to, I shouldn't be looking for it quite just yet, but maybe you want to kind of dip your toe in the water, get lukewarm with the idea of returning to work. Um, so our peer mentors um, are persons with disabilities themselves, and we'll match you with somebody depending on either the field you want to work in, if you, you match in field, or some folks like to work with somebody with a similar disability to themselves. Um, so we can offer both one-on-one -on -one sessions if that's what you're comfortable with. Uh, we also do group mentoring sessions. We have a session coming up next week. I've got the flyers for it on self-care, which is really important for mental health. Um, so the idea is that it's um, to get some support, someone to maybe talk about any fears about returning to work. Um, our mentors also do a lot of really fabulous referrals to different services across the city um, as well to try and get you ready to do that. Um, so the group mentoring sessions can include drop-in sessions, uh, mindfulness for employment success, health, wellness, and self-care, uh, employment mentoring and networking, life skills coaching and development, uh, connections to other community resources. Um, and for this, you can self-identify as an individual with a disability. Uh, the peer employment mentoring program can take place either at the Lakeshore and Islington location or our Dufferin and King location. We can also telecommute to mentor as well, um, so over the phone is fine. Uh, maybe connecting with your mentor via email is doable as well. 
Um, so this is the contact information for Matthew and I. I've also got my card on me if you want the, the portable version of this. Um, so I, maybe we'd want to get back to questions or getting back to um, some of our goals from today. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually my favorite topic. Um, so during the workshop, we would discuss um, when you need to disclose your disability to your employer. It is different for different folks. Like I say, whether or not your disability is evident to the employer is when you may or may not want to disclose, or if there's a large gap on your resume, you might want to make sure the employer knows you know, it was for a health reason, you weren't sitting at home twiddling your thumbs. Um, so sometimes it is, depending on the circumstance for different folks, it is ideal to disclose at different points. But then when you go about to do so, I think we were touching on this earlier, what is it that you need to say? Um, you don't need to necessarily tell them what the diagnosis is, but you need to identify uh, what needs to be accommodated or what are the disability related barriers. And I heard a lot about scheduling accommodations as well coming up here, or possibly changing rules for, uh, for a disability related reason. Uh, those are all things that would fall under um, accommodation of disability. Yes? Uh, I have 15 years experience uh, almost in the customer service. Mm -hmm. So after starting the, because then I quit a job because of my medical condition. Mm -hmm. Since last four and a half years. Mm -hmm. So then people start, start to start from the scratch or minimum wage or what? Um, it's hard to say for us. I, it depends. It's, sometimes it just depends on what kind of roles you might be able to find, what your skill set looks like. Like in an ideal world, employers understand. The research shows that you know a gap on your resume doesn't mean that you're not unprepared to return to work. It, sometimes, unfortunately, employers, they don't look at that too kindly uh, when they're sorting through the resumes. But ideally, it is something that it can be overgotten. Like I had a gap in my resume for a period of time for a disability reason. It can happen, and it can be a ways around it can be found. Uh, but um, it can be a barrier, yes. But it doesn't necessarily mean you start from scratch. I certainly don't believe you should have to start from scratch if you have so many years of experience in, in customer service. So question number one, ideas on where to start a job search. Um, how do you want to address this? Um, so it's always a good idea to take a look at your past work experience. Um, also, obviously, your interests and in what you'd like to do. Um, you just want to take stock of where your skills would be relevant if you do want to transition into um, a different field from the one that you were had the bulk of your past work experience. Um, I'm not as tall as Matthew. Yeah, yeah. Um, you also want to consider if you have um, had kind of a long period where you haven't been working, whether you want to jump back right into working full time or if you want to take things a little bit slower, uh, maybe go for a part time job instead. Um, that would be a little less strenuous than um, uh, full-time work in your previous field. So I know I've worked with individuals who have had quite a bit of a gap in their work history and sometimes they want to jump right back into uh, what they were doing previously and that a lot of the times it doesn't work well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they feel that they would be able to handle it, but once they're in that position, they kind of realize that I took on a little too much. Um, and then, you know, things happen in the workplace. Uh, they either quit or they get laid off, and um, they have to reconsider uh, whether doing something on a part time basis would be uh, better for them so they can ease their way back into the workforce. So that's something to keep in mind as well when you're um, thinking about reigniting your job search. Any other points you want to? Yeah, I think that's I think that's perfect. Yeah, you, I think you, you got to know where your skills are and where your strengths are. I think that's the main takeaway. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I, I I read the question a different way as to where I mean in the older days when we pick up the paper and look under classifieds. Mm -hmm. um, does where start? Where be like um, 
uh, a listing of job fairs, mm -hmm. find job boards, things like that? Yeah. Yeah, where today I'd say is definitely the internet. Um, like there are certain, depending on the field, there's different databases, of course. Um, or you could sign up for job search listservs with different organizations, have them as well. Maybe through your alumni association, perhaps. Um, yeah, today it's, we don't see too many things in the classifieds, of course. Um, everything is online. Um, as well, um, individual company websites, depending on uh, the field you're going into, um, it's always a good place to, to possibly check. But most places they will post it somewhere generally public, not just their own internal website, because they, they want to get a decent number of resumes in. Yep, and there's two uh, main websites, I would say, for job postings. One is Indeed, I want to write it, Indeed, and another one is Aluta, E-L-U-T-A. Yep, uh, so these websites, they're what are known as aggregators. So they look on the, they do a search for you basically. So you would type in what type of work that you're looking in and what area, and they'll pull up all of the job postings that are online um, from different sources. So it could be company websites, other job boards that are out there. Um, so they kind of compile everything um, on this one website. Yeah, and the Federal Job Bank as well. Uh, I think jobbank.gc.ca, or if you just Google Federal Job Bank, we'll, we'll do that as well, actually. In your workshop, that you did that you did provide all these little tips for people as to where they could possibly look at, uh, for postings? Yes, yeah, so, or we could talk about individualizing it too for, for the field or. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, so the second thing was definition of disability. Do you want to give? Sure. Yeah. Um, so as you saw, some of our programs, it is, um, it is self, uh, who self-identifies as a person with a disability for three of the programs. Um, the only one where we kind of have to go through government is employment accessibility services. Um, and it can be, um, if somebody is out of work and has something that's medically ver verifi verifiable from a doctor, uh, like I've never seen anything get rejected. Have you? <coughs> no. So it is fairly, um, it, there's a lot of flexibility around that. Um, in terms of the, um, on the job definition of disability, it is interpreted very broadly. Um, so many health conditions um, would often be a disability. I see often people, they don't think of themselves as having a disability, they think of themselves as having a health condition. But usually there's a legal duty to accommodate that said health condition. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So the next one was skills development for job search. Um, so in terms of skills development, that's what we do here at Job Start and what our program's about is developing your skills in order for you to be, become job ready. Um, uh, so what we call our core foundational job search skills or as Nora was calling it, the classics. So we make sure that your resume um, is up to a good standard. Interview skills are very good. Um, we teach you things about how to look for work, as we were touching on earlier, as well as those uh, soft skill pieces as well, communication skills, leadership, professional image. Um, uh, in addition to, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, did you have anything to add? Uh I think the other thing is confidence. I think that can be, and having, and having the, um, the benchmarks and the goals set. Um, that's also I think, something that we can do. Because if you're, maybe if you're job searching at home, it can feel less motivating. But if you know if you have an appointment and you, and you know you're going to have to report to us on how the job search is going, like we're not going to give you detention if we're not doing job applications. We're not teachers, but, but it can help keep you accountable to this. <laughs> Oh, the point I was going to make was also accommodation and disclosure. Uh, being able to have that conversation and knowing what to disclose, what not to disclose, that can be considered a skill. So that's something that we also touch on for skills development for job searching. So sorry, to that point, um, when you want to address 
your accommodations with your employer, who, who are you exactly speaking to? Your immediate boss, or do you go to HR? Like, what level, like, who do you address that? Right, so it will depend on the organization. Do you want to? Yeah, I could my, in my years in human rights, it just depends on the organization. Some managers are just afraid of having to deal with, with them being uh, litigated against, so they'll defer it all to the HR because they're the experts on it often. But many managers, if they have the, um, the experience, they'll be happy to discuss it with you um, as well. Or sometimes the HR department, just like no managerial decisions have to be made by managers. It depends on the structure of the workplace and who has what skill sets and what your manager's comfort level really is with um, discussing accommodations. Yeah, so I'd say in the workplace too, it just depends on I think who you feel more comfortable going to initially to discuss it, but I would say in terms of who might know in the workplace, expect it might be both the manager and the HR department. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so services specific to persons with disabilities. So I think we covered that through our, our presentation. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that sets apart the Employment Accessibility Program from your typical um, employment service agency is that we provide retention, what's called retention support. So usually for the typical um, employment services, once you are found a job, usually they do follow up maybe three at the three month period six month period but um, at that point they kind of discontinue working with you whereas for our program we continue to work with you while you're employed so we do monthly check-ins to see how things are going and we're available to you if you have any questions or concerns <coughs> um, mm -hmm. about the workplace mm -hmm. yep. um, information regarding accommodations we touched on that yeah yeah mm -hmm. uh, managing medical appointments with work um, so the rule of thumb I, th I know I said this earlier but I'll just repeat it again the rule of thumb is always try and ask the the medical practitioner if it's possible to book the medical appointment outside of your work hours um, like take notes when you're doing that or maybe do it in writing with them with them and then if it's not possible explain to your employer the medical appointment is necessary for a disability related reason um, in this case you could I would steer away from using the term health and just say disability um, it's for a disability related reason and I've tried to book it outside of work hours may I please get this scheduling accommodation um, and that would trigger the employer's duty to accommodate Okay, um, so the next one was appropriate jobs. So that's really going to be dependent on yourself, what an appropriate job is. It's going to look different for every individual. Um, so there's really no hard or fast rules. You have to you know, take stock of your skills, what you're comfortable doing, what your interests are, um, and even having that honest conversation with yourself about limitations as well. Right, so you have to consider all of these different factors um, uh, to kind of think of where you'd like to end up in, in terms of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, there's no easy answer with that one. It's mm -hmm. it, it's really going to depend on your individual circumstances. If someone were to go um, or to enroll into the six to eight week session uh, workshops, and then followed by the twelve week, um, I guess you would call it a paid work placement, right? Mm -hmm. um, at that point in time, um, would they and you also look for specific jobs that they could do? Because I think a lot of people here mentioned, I can't stand too long. I, I don't want that heavy yes. lifting. So would that be considered um, in, in the job yes. Absolutely, yeah, we find, uh, so part of the process too is our job developer, Michelle, will work with the employer and there'll be a written, part of your contract will be a conversation about what your accommodations will be. Uh, so it's gonna be in writing in advance of you starting the job. Yeah, and we work, um, so we, and we won't, we won't place you in a job that's completely inappropriate for disability reasons. Mm -hmm. And that first week of the capability program is all career exploration. So you have that entire week to, kind of self-reflect and think over, okay, what, what do I want to do? Where are my skills? Where are they most appropriate? Where is the most appropriate fit? What are my limitations? Uh, so you have that entire week to uh, think that over. 
What is the next intake for the, uh, that program? Capability? Yeah. Um, I think it says on the flyer. I think we're starting, it's yeah. 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 Yeah, it's starting, the next session of six to eight weeks is starting in May, and I think we're going to be starting to do, um, to do some intakes in the April, yeah. Mm -hmm. so why don't you just call you guys up? Uh, yes, so I think Irfan's contact information is on here. Yes, it is. Uh, for this one, his email is just down at the bottom. Oh, pardon me. And this one would be at the Lakeshore and Islington location. Thanks. Problem. Okay. Appropriate job shifting careers. Um, I think one thing we haven't touched on yet, if I may, is. Um, we all want to find jobs where we can shine. Um, we want to find a job that is a good fit for us. Yes, we might need some accommodations, but we want to do well in our workplace. So sometimes figuring out what is a good fit that works with my disability is always a really good way to look at your job search. Figuring out what are the things that I definitely can do, uh, what is a good career for these things that I definitely can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. how I always thought of it too when I was looking for work. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that that's also a process, right? So it could, there might be some trial and error involved in that. So um, I would say don't get discouraged if the the job that you have doesn't work out or doesn't pan out or is not an appropriate fit. Then you know what aspects of that job um, you weren't able to do or didn't like about the job, and then you can use that to uh, as a stepping stone for your next position. Yeah, so it is a process. There is some tinkering involved, right? You aren't going to know what the perfect job is going to be right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Maintaining employment. Um, so it is something we do work with you um, in retention in our program. Um, were there any, I think, um, specific concerns around maintaining employment that we'd want to address? Yeah, maintaining employment. What was your question? Any specific concerns around maintaining employment that we wanted to address? I think the question yeah. or that point came from somebody who said, um, what if they got a job and then they told their employer that they had lots of followers? Right. Like, what, you know, what sort of help could you provide right. on, on, on either helping them communicate with the employer or? Right. Um, like we talked about scheduling accommodations and what really often underlies that just having a positive uh, relationship with your employer overall can make a huge difference um, in success around maintaining employment even if you need accommodations for, for a disability related reason. Uh, like they should be, you know, they should accommodate regardless of whether or not it's a good relationship or not but in reality uh, that maintaining the positive relationship with your employer from the get-go, uh, having that as a base does make a pretty huge difference. Mm -hmm. If an employer is legally obligated to accommodate a disability, is an employer legally uh, obligated to accommodate uh, a health condition? Yes, um, yes. Most health conditions will will be a disability. Um, it's just most people are they aren't comfortable with the term disability. They prefer to think of it as a health condition. Uh, when I was working in human rights law, half of my disability cases, people didn't say they have a disability. They always said they had a human, they had a health condition. Uh, but once we kind of got into the disability, well, got into the details, as long as it's not a cold or a flu, um, generally a health condition will be able to fall under the definition of disability. Mm -hmm. Speaking very generally, we'd have to go case by case, but, but very generally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're seeing a specialist, it's most likely a disability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, so how, the next uh, point here was how much does an employer need to know about disability or about your disability? Um, so like uh, Nora was saying, they don't need to know your diagnosis, yeah. right? But they do need to be made aware of any accommodations that you require mm -hmm. um, if you want to disclose and um, request for accommodations, mm -hmm. right? A letter from a doctor is a good thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and the letter from the doctor doesn't need to specify, you know, 
what the disability is. It can just say, I'm sorry, what's your name again? Kenny. Kenny has a health condition. Please note that he requires um, to only stand for X amount of time and then a break of X amount. Um, so then the employer's got a legal duty to accommodate that. So maybe they structure your day so that some of you, they give you, um, if they need somebody to review inventory, they ask you to do that while seated for a period of time during that day. Like they can find a way to, um, to make sure that your, your work schedule fits within the accommodations. Um, the employer has a legal duty. I know it no, sounds, it yeah. A golf cart and everything, eh? Yeah, possibly <laughs> if that's what you need, as that meets a disability related need and yeah. it fits within the structure of the workplace and you can still do the essential bona fide duties at your job. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Does Amazon hire disability pe disabled people? Of course they have to. Um, are they gonna make a big thing here or is that I read they are coming, yes. Uh, they are coming to Toronto. Um, yes, um, like every every organization out there, um, I think if you go through the rosters, if you really talk to the employees, every organization probably has a person or two on the payroll, if not more, who have a disability. Um, so you don't necessarily have to go to the jobs for disabled people. Like there are some, some specialized employers out there um, that might have specific <laughs> roles for it. Uh, but, but there's no reason why any employer can't make some reasonable accommodations for disability. Like yeah. It's, it's not, they don't have, they don't have to, to accommodate you, do they? They have to. Well, they do. They, they have to. Is they there a percentage of people they have to hire? Not, um, not in Canada, in other regions, yes. Um, uh, the employer, so they can't hold it against you in a job competition. So they can't say, oh, Kenny's got a gap in his resume. He must have been off of sick. So I don't want to hire him again in case he might get sick again. The employer cannot be doing that. Um, or once you go to your employer and you say, hey, I need this um, accommodation in the workplace, please, to do with um, structure of my tasks. They can't say, okay, here's your pink slip. <laughs> Like they have a legal duty to accommodate and they always have to participate in what I call the accommodation dance. So your employer has a legal duty to accommodate up to the point of undue hardship. And there's three areas where they can argue undue hardship. One is absolutely fair. It's health and safety for yourself or others. Um, and they have to have an identifiable health and safety issue and they have to prove that there's no other way to accommodate around that. Number two is financial. So they'd have to be able to prove that accommodating you is going to make the company go bankrupt. And it's not about the budget line for the department you're in, it's about the budget line for the entire organization as well. Um, so any, any large employer, they're gonna have a really hard time arguing duty to accommodate. It's usually like a small mom and pop shop that has a very expensive accommodation. The other thing to keep in mind is that most accommodations don't cost the employer anything. On average, if it is going to cost the employer something, the average cost is about $500 per employee. So when I consider the training costs to hire a new employee, when I consider the um, when I consider the um, the time it's going to take, I'm going to have a job vacant. When I consider the um, the cost to advertise position and to spend time hiring them. It's usually much more cost effective for an organization to, um, to work with a person with a disability to find reasonable accommodations. Um, the other thing, that's a dot, there's zero, so, uh, not, <laughs> not that much. Um, so the employer, it, there is a business case for hiring people with disabilities. The other thing that um, we argue that, um, that across the disability employment field people argue a lot is that people with disabilities stay in their jobs longer. There's less turnover when you hire somebody with a disability. So there is definitely a business case for hiring persons with disabilities for your employer. Um, anyways, I deviated from duty to accommodate up to undue hardship. Uh, the third one is human resources capacity. Um, so the employer does not need to hire somebody else to work with you one-on-one -on -one all day as daily, all day support. Um, and then it also comes to bumping around in jobs. Um, so I always use this example. Say my job is to talk to people on the phone all day. Then I'm at a very loud party on the weekend and I lose all of my hearing. I can no longer do my job on the phone. 
Uh, so my employer then has to consider, is there a way for us to accommodate Nora in her current job? Uh, they might say, is there a technology option that we can use to accommodate Nora so that maybe everything gets transcribed for her? C doesn't have the right oral fluency um, to use that technology, or um, it's just not working very well. Uh, then my employer has to say, okay, is it possible to uh, give Nora a lateral role? So maybe in this call center we get a few emails, so maybe they could have me be the sole person uh, working on all the emails. Um, and great, that's my job now. But say we don't get too many emails, it's not really enough to, um, to spill up a day of work for me. Then the employer can consider, is it possible to move Nora into a lateral role? So maybe they've got an administrative role ready that's at the same pay grade, um, same skills. Um, so they can move me into that role. But they don't have to move somebody else out of that admin role if they are fully staffed. But if there's an opening, they can move me there. After they've gone through those steps, this is the accommodation dance we're talking about, uh, they can consider, okay, is it possible to create a new role for NARA? Maybe they need somebody doing background research for the organization uh, so they can create that role for me. But maybe it's just a project that lasts a little bit of time or they don't really have that available. In that case, only after my employer has gone through all of those steps does my employer have a point where they can say, sorry, it's undue hardship, uh, we need to end this employment relationship. They have to go through all those steps first. Okay. Um, so the last point was, can employers share that you have a disability? And I think you, you touched on yeah, that, yeah. They, um, they shouldn't really. It doesn't create a great work environment. In cases where I've seen it happen, it's not ideal in the workplace, um, but I just say, as a point of caution, maybe when you're speaking to the employer, just remind them, I'd appreciate if we just keep this between you and me. That just signals to the employer to maybe not talk to everybody about it. Because sometimes it does happen in the workplace, or people might notice the accommodations. Uh, but just saying to the employer, can we just keep this between you and me? It's, it's just a good tip to, to throw that in there. Yeah, and then occasionally they might need to talk to the HR department, maybe another manager within the organization, or um, yeah, and maybe if they need to get a colleague to cover for you for a disability, re like because you have to go to a medical appointment, they can just say, you know, um, someone's got a medical appointment, or not even a medical appointment, somebody has an appointment, it's okay to please cover. They don't need to say, oh, you know, so-and-so's got to go to another medical appointment. It doesn't, it's not necessary to bring that in there. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Was there any other questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, uh, we have to decide right, what kind of job we need before the 68 week pre employment training, or after we do that, then we decide where we, we get a place. Um, it's dependent a bit more on say what's available. Like Matthew came into my job office the other day and said he wanted a 150k job in government. I don't know if I can get him that. <laughs> yeah. Question is, yeah. Do we have to decide what kind of job we get before the training it's or after the training? Yeah. See what's available yeah. And then we it would help to have an idea yeah. of what you'd like to go into. Yeah. Right. Like I was saying, mentioning before that first week is all about career exploration mm -hmm. so there um, you'll get a lot of time to think about uh, what type of work you'd like to go into but it's always helpful to have you know some idea instead of starting the program without any idea of what type of work you'd like to do yeah. so it doesn't have to be a specific position at a specific organization or anything like that mm -hmm. but having like a general idea of the field that you think you would like to go into is would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Do you have a list what you have, what's available there like for placement or you don't have? Uh, we had some examples of uh, places where we found work before. So like um, healthcare I think was listed. So healthcare, services. financial services, customer service, information technology, um, social services as well. <laughs> They've been able to place people in a variety of different industries. Um, for the placements, I think it would depend on what the role is. Some roles are a bit more entry level through the placement process, um, so it might be a bit more on the job training. Um, but sometimes it is, like, it's not necessarily designed as an internship per se, where you're only being trained. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Framed to be a boss. 
Yeah, I'd say like uh, the disability employment field, like it used to be like 30 years ago, um, it would be, oh, you're disabled, you have X disability, you must go into X field. That was the old vocational rehab model. Today it's moved on a bit. Um, so today we kind of think, because I think a person should reasonably be able to do the job that they train for and that they want to do. It doesn't mean just because you have a disability, you must do this role. Um, so it's moved beyond that. There are still some organizations out there, uh, for example, people for people with intellectual disabilities uh, that might have specialized employment. Um, but generally, the field's really moving beyond that. I keep, keep asking the question. Yeah. Uh, are there specific companies that, that we recommend? Yeah. <laughs> that you recommend? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Not so much because. <laughs> Pretty good. Every company has a requirement, right, right. to, yeah. to mm -hmm. hire persons with disabilities, but right? There's so. no guy going, oh, I want to get, uh, I want to hire, like, I want to do a job opportunity if you mm -hmm. want compatible, does it anymore? Yeah, because every employer should yeah. be willing to hire a person with a disability. They can't be holding it against you. Um, like, there are some employers, um, federally regulated industries or the federal government, they do have to do statistics um, if an individual's willing to disclose on whether or not they have a disability. But usually what they're reporting is just they're reporting the statistics. They don't necessarily have um, a target, per se. Um, there are occasionally you might see um, employment equity programs in place as well, or um, Section 18 of the code, um, I'm thinking like organizations, um, so like organizations that work with people with disabilities, they sometimes want to make sure that they hire people with disabilities themselves. So sometimes that is a circumstance where you might want to disclose that you are a person with a disability because they want people with disabilities in leadership roles. Um, so that might be a situation where, where it is more ideal to disclose. Um, early on or to think about a place where it's um, a good fit. Um, like is there, uh, for my human rights days, I have to keep the names confidential. I can't tell you the names of the employers. I'm thinking, oh, I would never work there, unfortunately. I, I can't disclose that to you. Um, there are some places, though, but um, yeah. I like to say the pay wasn't good for that job, but it was the best job I've ever had. Yeah. It was all family. Yeah. So it was really nice. But then because it was a making mechanical things. Yeah. Everything's digital now. Mm -hmm. he, went a, he went out of business. So mm -hmm. like he's the, probably the last of the, of the good guys that would hire somebody like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've got to guess that um, it would be helpful if there was, if, if you could generate a list of employers who were empathetic to people with disabilities because then it would allow you know our crowd here today just to target their resumes yeah. and their covers letters yeah. to those organizations. Yeah. Even then, the federal government doesn't have good statistics. Right? Yeah, they don't. They don't necessarily match the labor market availability, as they put it. Um, program every day. You got to come to it. Uh, for capability. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, capability. It will run for six to eight weeks, and it is um, a daily session, um, Monday to Thursday. Yes, they do provide TTC tokens for the capability. No. Okay. Yeah. Coffee. Coffee, snacks. Um, I, I did want to touch on something. Um, one way that you can identify employers who would be more warm or open to hiring persons with disabilities is to see their job postings and look for a diversity, equity, inclusion statement. Mm -hmm. So a lot of job postings um, that are out there, especially for like our industry, social services, you'll find that a lot of the financial sector, you will find these diversity, inclusion, uh, statements as well. Um, they just have like it's just basically a commitment to hire um, from diverse groups. So yeah. It'll say diverse. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it will be like a, a statement, a few sen sentences, uh, okay. yeah. making that commitment. Yeah. Or sometimes in the posting, um, according to the Accessibility for Ontarians Disabilities Act, in any posting, an employer is supposed to note that you're welcome to ask for accommodations. Mm -hmm. Regardless of whether or not they write that, they still have to accommodate you in a job interview should that be needed. Um, so for somebody who needs sign language interpretation, for example, they have to provide that. But it's a good indicator of if the employer's on the ball about accessibility. 
that's also a good way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'm just wondering, just in case there are some people who can't make it to the six to eight week program, what, what is available for them at Job Start as far as job coaching goes? Um, so that would be employment accessibility services. Um, if you can't do or don't qualify for capability, um, for most adults, that would mean working with either Matthew or I um, for appointments, uh, check-ins, retention supports, um, or so one-on-one -on -one coaching. And then we can always refer you to many workshops through Job Start as well on resume writing, um, interview skills as well. These companies, um, I find that I can't get up in the morning and, and do things for like <coughs> several hours. Mm -hmm. and then I, I feel better by 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. like, is there any company that does that? Like, like you usually have to start work at eight o'clock in the morning or something like that, or nine o'clock. Yeah. But like the restaurant industry or shift work, maybe. That's what it is. Oh uh, well, no, it's more than that. It's just off the top of my head. Yeah. I guess if I start my machine at six o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. A couple of hours. Yeah. Yeah, so scheduling accommodation around that as well would be um, something your employer would have to um, consider. Um, so is it, depending on the nature of the work. So if you are a school teacher, maybe they can't move class to start at noon, but maybe they could, um, if you're doing like an, um, a shift work in an, um, in an auto plant, maybe they could give you the afternoon shift. It's mm -hmm. tough labor, isn't it? Sorry? That's hard labor, isn't it? Yeah. Or there's many other jobs with shift work available, call centers. Okay. Yeah. 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 Apparently, we can't lift anything over 20 pounds. Over our hands. We're not supposed to. We're 30 pounds. Uh -huh. 20, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. I was doing the, uh, I was helping the delivery guy with my boxes. Yeah. And I, I realized that I was hurting my body just picking up those, those mm -hmm. boxes. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine working in, a, you know, in an auto plant. I don't know what they, mm -hmm. other than uh, working in the, in the uh, office, I don't know what you could do there. Um, they, That's why I said blue Yeah, blue. yeah, they designed, like, from, from what I saw, they've designed a lot of the, um, the equipment to be very ergonomic these days, and they do have, like, many of the large auto plants. So they aren't really in the Toronto area, I think, but a lot of them do have procedures in place to, um, to assess and work with an employee with a disability. So they might have you working with only specialized roles within the auto plant. Um, so there might be things where it's just a button, perhaps. That'd be nice. Yeah. Or even wash, uh, pushing a mop, pushing a, a, a broom for uh, like 30 yeah. bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. I know a guy who's mm -hmm. a janitor mm -hmm. in a big operation, and he makes $35 an hour sweeping the floor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can. He's unionized there. Yeah, that can happen. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess the point with career exploration explore what you think you would like to do, what you could do, mm -hmm. what you can't do, mm -hmm. maybe also to learn about what the industry might have to offer mm -hmm. also, right? Yes. <coughs> Some of the limitations in the industry for you too, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we start to register for the six, eight weeks uh, um, training, Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be starting in uh, April. Um, Ifram is the um, the contact person. You've got his email right at the bottom there um, that you could reach out to, and he could discuss um, intaking with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we need to uh, email first, right? Yes. For registration request, right? Yes, um, and he would. He's going to be starting doing intaking soon. It does tend to be a very popular program in the EI. We also have to get approval through Service Canada as well to register somebody. And, we, and it's also about, are you a good fit for this program as well? Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to get involved with this, but is if, if, if. So the ones at Dufferin are the Employment Accessibility Program and the Transitions for Youth Program. Mm -hmm. Can you pass one question, please? Okay, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And this is what I need. Mean. This is what I need. Mean. If that's what you'd like to. Uh, you, yeah, so if that's what you'd like to do, then you would give uh, Earth friend a call. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Yeah. Then we are always strong staff, so I'm going to play Mm-hmm. I think Nora would be a better person to answer that question. 
so two o'clock appointment, employers being left short staffed. Um, so the employer, um, so what you'd want to show the employer is that you attempted to schedule the appointment outside of work hours. So call the doctor's office and take notes while you're doing it saying, is it possible to schedule this outside of my work hours? Have a discussion with it. Um, from there, you want to take it, tell the employer, I've got an appointment connected to a disability related reason. Um, is it possible to uh, please have a, an accommodation? Um, so maybe the employer can plan in advance to have somebody else there for coverage, or they can adjust your shift schedule uh, for you. Um, and the employer has a legal duty to accommodate a disability related medical appointment. So not say going to my doctor just to get a checkup, but if it's for a disability related reason um, or a health condition or you're seeing a specialist, the employer's got a legal duty to accommodate that under the human rights code. Yeah, yeah, perfect. This year says it started, uh, already started, next session starts at February the 11th, 2019. Oh, yeah, I think I got sent um, the incorrect one. The next session is starting in May. Yeah. Irfran's contact information is there. You can send him an email, give him a call. He, he just said, uh, just so he will invite you in uh, for an intake uh, appointment, and um, he'll ask some questions as to gauge whether this program would be the right fit, and then take it from there. So they would also need to check with um, service candidates to see if you're eligible for employment insurance. Uh, if you are, unfortunately, you won't be able to do the program, but if you're not eligible for employment insurance, um, you may be able to, to participate in the, uh, the program. Another question. How do you know? I used to work part-time for years. Yep. And I was told that I think you can get unemployment insurance, but we don't know because it's so complicated. Service Canada would know. <laughs> they, yeah. they would, you just they put in your information and they, it, it will come back whether yes you are eligible for employment insurance or no yeah i think you need 920 pounds yeah it depends on the circumstances a number of hours i think before you worked there but then they have exemptions in place as well for certain circumstances so yeah it's i'd say if you're ever uncertain just call service canada and they can tell you probably best to not do the guesswork talk to the experts because the rules are always changing too there I'm not eligible. I yeah. Work for oh, I'd like to give him a big hand. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.